On our program this week, the formation of rust, the action of detergents, and soft matter. In the industrialized nations, it is estimated that 3% of the annual gross domestic product is spent on damage caused by corrosion. Every year, 20% of the steel produced goes into rebuilding structures destroyed by corrosion. There are several types of corrosion. The most well-known is rust. There is a chemical phenomenon that causes industrialized nations substantial economic losses. It is called corrosion. Corrosion attacks all types of metal, causing it to deteriorate and eventually to fail. Corrosion attacks automobiles, boats, bridges, gates, and works of art. The most common form of corrosion is rust. Rust forms on iron and iron-containing materials by low-temperature oxidation in the presence of water. Let's see how rust forms on this iron sample in fast motion. Chemical corrosion occurs in several stages. Three elements have to be present for rust to form. Iron, oxygen, and water. Initially, some of the iron atoms will each liberate two electrons and become ferrous ions. An ion is an atom that has lost or gained electrons. The ferrous ions dissolve in water. Second, the liberated electrons combine with the oxygen of the air that is dissolved in the water. This reaction produces hydroxyl ions. These ions trigger the formation of rust. Because they have a negative electrical charge, the hydroxyl ions are attracted by the ferrous ions, which have a positive charge. A precipitate then forms on the iron surface, that is, a substance that is insoluble in water, rust. Viewed under a scanning electron microscope, which probes the surface of objects, rust appears to be a highly complex mineral structure made up of crystals and amorphous substances, that is, substances which have no clear form. Actually, there are many types of rust. This complicates the work of scientists looking for ways to prevent it. For objects exposed to air, humidity, in most cases, accounts for their vulnerability to corrosion. Water and oxygen, however, are not the only agents of corrosion. Pollutants in the air have a tendency to accelerate the oxidation of a metal. Indeed, the humidity in the air deposits a fine, condensed moisture layer on metal surfaces. Solid or gaseous pollutants get deposited on these surfaces and are dissolved in the moisture layer. Often, these contaminants make condensed moisture acidic. Sulfur dioxide, for instance, present in industrial waste and in urban atmospheres, dissolves in water to form sulfuric acid which accelerates corrosion. Since the turn of the century, global levels of atmospheric acidity have increased due to pollution. The deterioration of metal structures in urban and industrial areas is now occurring at an alarming rate. Solid particles deposited on metal surfaces from polluted atmospheres are also corrosive. In marine atmospheres, particles of salt, sodium chloride, from the sea dissolve, becoming chloride ions and sodium ions. These dissolved ions increase the conductivity of the water and facilitate the liberation of electrons by the iron atoms, the first stage leading to the formation of rust. And yet, there exist many methods of corrosion protection. First, there is passive protection, achieved by coating objects with a protective metal shield that protects it from the oxidizing atmosphere. During production, 
automobile bodies are completely immersed in a cataphoretic bath that reaches into their every nook and cranny. Then there is the paint, which forms a screen between the atmosphere and the iron and helps to delay corrosion. To prevent seawater from corroding reinforced concrete structures, active protection is used. Cathodic protection, for instance, consists of passing an electrical current into the object to prevent the reaction by which the metal dissolves. The current carries electrons that build up on the metal and prevent ferrous ions from leaving it. This blocks the chemical corrosion. This method is used to protect bridges or tidal power stations. In archaeology, the same principle is used to extract marine relics from their matrix or gang. The gang consists of iron salts produced by the seawater's action on the metal. On contact with the air and water, iron salts release hydrochloric acid, which destroys part of the object's metal. There is a simple way of cleansing such relics. They are immersed with their gang in an electrolytic tank. After several hundred hours, the passing of the electrons softens the gang. The objects can then be extracted from their gang as if from a mold. It was the technique used to recover a cannon from an 18th century Russian ship. While rust remains a problem that we cannot eliminate completely, the new technologies have given us means to better control chemical corrosion. Where there's water, there's liable to be rust. One of the reasons the internal parts of automatic washers don't rust is because detergents contain sodium silicate. This compound helps prevent the transferal of metal ions to the water solution. Sodium silicate is but one of the many chemical substances found in detergents. On the whole, detergents are not considered toxic. Some of their components, however, may be harmful to the environment. Any given detergent usually contains about a dozen chemicals. Three of them have a direct bearing on the efficiency of the wash. They are surface active agents, or surfactants, bleaching agents, and softening agents. Surface active agents are a detergent's basic chemicals. They play two roles related to their molecular structure. Their molecules have an elongated shape. One end is said to be hydrophilic, meaning having an affinity for water. The other is lipophilic and has an affinity for fats or other lipids. It's the surfactant's hydrophilic extremity that allows the most common grease stains to be diluted. A grease stain immersed in water will not become wet spontaneously because the water has great difficulty reaching the stain and getting in between it and the fibers. The water molecules tend to form a film on the surface of the grease stains. They bind together, creating a force called surface tension. Surface tension, combined with repulsion by the grease stains, prevents their impregnation. One of the roles of surfactants is to lower that surface tension so the fabric can be made wet, a basic requirement for washing. Next, the surfactant's lipophilic extremity comes into play. It carries out the surfactant's second role, namely degreasing the stains embedded in the material. The principle of dispersing grease is really quite simple. While the lipophilic part of the surfactant clings to the grease stains, its hydrophilic part is drawn to the large amounts of water present in the washing solution. 
the grease is surrounded by surfactant molecules. The mechanical action during the washing dislodges the stain from the fiber. Colored stains, on the other hand, made by organic matters such as coffee, tea or fruit, resist surface active agents. In order to remove these stains, a bleaching agent, a detergent's second basic compound, is added to the detergent. The bleaching agent directly attacks the chemical structure of the stain molecules. It breaks them down into smaller molecules, which are easier to remove from the fabric. Unfortunately, a good washing is easier said than done, especially when the water is hard, that is, containing calcium and magnesium. Many stains and some fabrics, such as cotton, are charged with negative ions at their surface. These electrical charges attract the positive ions represented by the calcium and magnesium in hard water. These ions, therefore, have a tendency to redeposit on the fabric. An example is the ring left in bathtubs. They become encrusted in the fibers, making stains hard to remove, especially as they often react with the surfactant, decreasing the effectiveness of the bleaching agent. It is therefore necessary to trap the calcium ions, which are often present in large quantities. This is where the softening agents, such as phosphates, come in. Phosphates capture the positive calcium and magnesium ions in hard water and by doing so, soften the water. The surfactant is then able to fulfill its cleansing role. Unfortunately, while not directly toxic for living things, phosphates are harmful to the environment. Their disposal in rivers or lakes encourages the growth of large populations of algae and other aquatic organisms in these waters. This enrichment, called eutrophication, may interfere with the normal ecological balance of the receiving waters. Phosphates act as fertilizers. The receiving waters become too rich in nutrients, and especially in phosphorus compounds. The additional phosphorus causes the algae present in the water to proliferate rapidly, leading to an ecological imbalance. The algae feed the aerobic bacteria which consume the oxygen in the water. Once most of the oxygen has been consumed, anaerobic bacteria, which can grow and metabolize in the absence of oxygen, develop at the expense of the aerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria produce methane and hydrogen sulfide, which give off a highly offensive odor. Also, the depletion of oxygen in the environment disturbs wildlife. Certain species of fish completely disappear. It is therefore imperative that we cut down on our use of phosphates, especially since we know that 40% of the phosphates in domestic wastewaters are produced by laundry washing. A number of industries have proposed substitutes for phosphates that would be more environmentally friendly. One example is citric acid, a natural substance contained, among others, in lemon juice. It is already being used as a softening agent in some washing powders and cleansers. Citric acid does not cause eutrophication and degrades rapidly. Let's hope our obsession with whiter than white laundry will not outweigh our need for a clean environment. Glues, like detergents, are centuries old. The first glues were natural substances such as resins, egg whites, or even blood. Today, synthetic polymers have replaced those natural substances. Glues, like many other compounds, are part of a new field of study, the study of soft matter. Until now, chemistry described matter in three major phases. The solid phase, the liquid phase, and the gaseous phase. It was known that matter could go from one phase to the next, depending on temperature and pressure conditions. In solid phase, the molecules are very close together. For example, a crystalline solid, such as ice, is formed by evenly stacked water molecules. 
Conversely, in gaseous phase, the molecules are in a state of total chaos. They are spaced out as if they were independent of each other. Between the two is the liquid phase. The molecules are fairly close to each other and slide one on top of the other relatively freely. Besides those three states, there exists a rather astounding third phase in between the solid and the liquid phases. This particular type of matter is called condensed matter, or more commonly, soft matter. Drawn directly from the incredible richness of nature, soft matter offers many new and rapidly changing materials. Glues, for instance, paints, liquid crystals, and even yogurt are composed of soft matter. Soft matter can be defined as a tangle of long molecules called polymers. Polymers are themselves formed by combining constitutional units called monomers, repetitively linked to each other. These polymers bond together, forming spherical structures, coils or chains. These structures lose their shape continuously, since their constituent molecules always remain movable in relation to each other. Polymer adhesive, a commonly used soft matter, still poses problems for scientists. Indeed, to this day, the phenomenon of adhesion remains somewhat unclear. Science has observed that breaking the elastic chemical bonds of a polymer adhesive, such as epoxy, requires a hundred to a thousand times more energy than breaking the non-elastic bonds of other kinds of glues. Since adhesive force cannot be measured accurately, the manufacturers have little technical data to predict how an adhesive bond will behave. All they can do is measure, in the laboratory, the result of the separation of bonded components. Various types of standardized mechanical tests are conducted. For example, by bonding two sheets of a given material, one on top of the other, and using a tensile shear test, they can measure the breaking force perpendicular to the glue joint. Similarly, by bonding a supple substrate on a rigid one, by using a peel test, they are able to measure the separation force parallel to the glue joint. These mechanical tests also tell the manufacturers a glue's potential to adhere to a given material. Glues adhere because of two types of forces. Adhesive forces are the forces exerted between the substrate and the adhesive molecules. Cohesive forces are the forces the adhesive molecules exert between themselves. Adhesive failure is an interfacial bond failure between the adhesive and substrate. In this case, the adhesive forces of the joint are weaker than the cohesive forces. Should such a failure occur, it is because the adhesive does not have sufficient bonding power on the material. By contrast, a cohesive failure occurs when the fracture allows a layer of adhesive to remain on both substrates. The adhesive forces are then greater than the cohesive forces. In this case, the adhesive bonds well to the material, but its cohesion is destroyed by the breaking force. In practice, what commonly occurs is a combination of the two types of failures. The relative percentage of adhesion and cohesion is then determined in order to evaluate the adhesive's effectiveness. Other compounds, such as liquid crystals, are also soft matters. Liquid crystals are in an intermediate state between crystal and fluid. Indeed, their molecular arrangement is somewhere between the total order of crystal and the total disorder of liquid, where molecules move about randomly. The best known liquid crystals are pneumatic crystals. They are commonly used in watch liquid crystal displays and certain super thin computer screens. The liquid crystals are sandwiched between two thin glass filters. Normally, these elongated molecules arrange themselves in the direction of the glass filters. They then have a translucent, glassy look. 
However, when subjected to an electrical field, they arrange themselves parallel to that field or perpendicular to the glass filters. This changes the optical appearance of the crystals, which then become opaque. The main advantage of liquid crystal systems is that they require very little electrical power to work. In addition, they are the only electronic display systems that can be read clearly in sunlight. Soft matter is one of the rare fields of basic research to have so many industrial applications. Rust-resistant steel, miracle detergents, super powerful glues. Today's chemists are concocting products the alchemists of the Middle Ages would never have dreamt of.